we'll uh, go on to the next uh, talk and uh, <coughs> which is the last uh, talk uh, of this uh, session before we break for lunch. Uh, <coughs> in the next talk, we will have three uh, presenters uh, from Equinor. Uh, <coughs> Uh, we'll talk about the local mobility and unconventional resources on NCS. And these are Raghu Kulkarni, Martin Niemann and Tom Anders Seeland. Uh, <coughs> Raghu Kulkarni holds a PhD in chemical engineering and has been with Equinor since 2002 in the variety of production and reservoir engineering positions in DPN and TPD. Most recently as discipline leader in reservoir on Nuance Rider of Field Development. Raghu currently serves as Senior Advisory Reservoir in R&T Expert Center, focusing on unconventional reservoirs. Uh, Martin Niemann holds a PhD in Geochemistry from the University of Victoria and has been with uh, Statoil Equinor since uh, 2012 as a geochemist in a variety of positions covering exploration, new ventures and unconventionals. His work centers around gas analysis and interpretation with a strong focus on stable isotopes and mud gas logging and currently work as a mud gas expert towards national and international projects all across uh, the value chain. And uh, Trond Anders Seeland holds a Master of Science in Elementary Particle Physics from the University of Oslo and has been with Equinor since 1992. Trond has experience from petrophysical work on wells and fields in many of the countries where Equinor operate and was central in the development of Equinor's petrophysical LFP uh, workflow. So uh, thank you all uh, three of you for being here and uh, uh, you can just share your presentation and, uh, and uh, start. There, uh, there is it. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, the uh, little bit on why uh, we thought of this presentation. I, uh, as you said in the introduction, uh, was working with Johannes Fördrup, and I was not completely aware of what was happening in the US with the shale oil and gas. And then in 2018, I, after the Johannes Fördrup uh, involvement towards uh, PDOs, uh, I started working uh, with US onshore shale, and I was amazed with what they have accomplished in uh, U.S. Uh, onshore uh, source rock uh, plays. And then I thought, yeah, uh, shouldn't this be also available in Norway? And that's where I started talking internally about uh, with different colleagues to see how we can characterize it. And that's how Trond got involved maybe a year and a half ago to see where there are source rocks. And then this year uh, came uh, across Martin and said, yeah, can we use mud gas logging to kind of get some ideas if such source rocks have some hydrocarbons even in Norway. And that we'll present. And uh, the last objective was many times, like even some earlier um, speakers have communicated, exploration is a joint effort. Uh, Cross-disciplinary involvement of the engineers on how to develop a certain resource is important then to assume the current uh, cost uh, structures or the current way of producing things. Uh, so uh, I'll share some experiences, what they have done US onshore, but also offshore, where you can get to some price levels, which will make such complicated plays, not just source rock plays, but like we saw some carbonate plays, uh, uh, economical on NCS. So that's uh, kind of the background on uh, why we uh, have this sh short talk. So now uh, to give uh, again a background, uh, the year is uh, 2010. You have to imagine uh, year 2010. Uh, the production in US onshore has been falling since 1970. Uh, US has gone to wars for uh, oil in uh, different parts of the world. And then there is a small company, Mitchell Oil, working in Dallas area. They are almost on the verge of bankruptcy. And uh, the big oil companies, Exxon, Chevron, have sold all the assets in the Dallas area. They have gone away. And uh, they, uh, the usual way is to fracture using viscous gels, but these people wanted to make a last try 
of using slick water. And it worked. Mitchell Energy uh, production almost doubled uh, that year. It sold the company for two billion and went on to acquire other areas where it can prosper, the source rock place. And the production in uh, oil, it was almost nothing. It's almost producing eight million barrels per day oil uh, from this place. The gas, it had already started something, but it expanded and just Marcellus produces more gas than the whole NCS uh, gas production. And the US went from almost uh, low production to now uh, producing uh, 12 million barrels per day. So this is what happened. And even though you would think uh, working in Norway 2018, I should be aware, I was not so aware of the big scale that this has happened on. And Norway, uh, if you want to compare the production, we have gone to maybe 4 million barrels per day uh, in uh, 1970 to uh, 2012. And this was accomplished in less than a decade. Of course, the price fell, and now there is overabundance of both gas and oil uh, in the world. The predictions, it's not small either. And that's the that's the thing that, that is once you have shown it, it's a continuous resource play. Oil and gas is always there. It's a technology to get it out of the ground. So the predictions are quite uh, high uh, oil production for uh, next decades. Same with gas, uh, very high uh, production for next decades. And that is a consequence of the reserves, the reserves which had been decreasing for many years started going up, you are double what you had uh, in reserves, oil reserves, and same with gas reserves. Of course, they fell after the price uh, fall in 2020 because this is uh, economical reserves, and they will go up again now that the oil price is uh, back to uh, normal. And these are the different plays. Uh, when we were in 2018, perhaps some plays were not economical, but now, even those have been made economical. So new paradigm is source rock is your reservoir. Go to where the source rock is and uh, you'll find perhaps some place which you can make economical. And the good thing about this is usually uh, you already have produced the conventional place. So you have the infrastructure in place and the source rocks are not very far away from your uh, from your conventional fields. And that's what you see uh, over whole US. Uh, you had oil and gas production here, and that's where these plays are. But what you have done is you have drilled a whole lot of wells, almost 10,000 wells per year. Each well doesn't produce much, but when you do it on a scale, you uh, get lots of production. And then to remember what this is, I mean, you can imagine each well in Bakken, if I give you an example of Bakken, uh, the well is 10,000 foot uh, long, and there is a football field every 20 feet. Every three meters, there is a football field that intersects the well, accessing a big area around it. So what you lack in permeability, we saw some permeability uh, of carbonates and so on, and 0.1 millidarcy, 0.01. The permeability that I have in the models there while doing history matching is 10 to 20 nanodarcy. So we are the fracturing methods, doing it on scale and controlling the costs you have made possible production from 20, uh, 30, 50 nanodarcies. So huge drilling effort and factory mode. So the costs are important. So now coming back to uh, uh, NCS, I have two plots here. One is the source rock maturity and together all with all the infrastructure on NCS. And you see the big fields. Again, they are very near the source rock, and that's very logical. Uh, and then the water depth. So if you want to focus, you should focus on the lower water depths and where there are source rocks in probably, uh, yeah, the condensate, the Eagleford, and so on. These fields have 
shown good uh, in the condensate uh, that would allow you to produce uh, a lot of uh, gas with some uh, condensate. So again, when you look at these fields or the recovery factors uh, in many of this oil or liquid plates, all you're doing is you're going down, the reservoir is uh, 2030 nano Darcy, you are creating a lot of fractures and all you are doing is let the thing produce out of own reservoir energy. So the uh, energy is just by depletion and the recovery factors that you get in liquid plays at least are like maximum 10%, 8 to 10% uh, are high enough recoveries and same then happens for gas reservoirs, you could probably get uh, 40 to uh, 50%. So the main idea is how much of the oil is still there in this source rock. And if you can access it, make the fractures of the right dimensions, you can get probably 10% out of it. Or if it's gas, you can get something more. So in place is very important. And uh, even if I assume 6% porosity and uh, very low uh, uh, saturations, you can get its big area and it gives a huge volume that potentially can be there. And in addition, we have lots of discovered low permeability and tight resources already in the database, which need the same technology solution. So if you can get the, them on scale, you can potentially uh, use that in your near field uh, infrastructure uh, place. So Tron, the, the next is uh, how uh, we kind of looked at the logs to find the sections which could be focus of mud gas analysis and so on. You have to unmute Trond. Uh, thank you, Raghu. Uh, uh, I, I work on the same floor as uh, Raghu and he came over to me and asked about how, how can we identify uh, uh, interesting intervals from logs. Um, and I am not a, w one of the guys in the company that do uh, compute TOC from uh, the state of the art techniques. That's other guys. But I, I, I sit on a big database we have in Equinor called the LFP database that have uh, logs from more than 2,000 wells in a in a consistent uh, way. They are have the unique names uh, in this all the wells, so it's easy to to generalize methods uh, and look at a large amount of data. <clears throat> and uh, I wanted to make a, a, a layout that is very simple. It's only utilizing raw logs, what you call raw logs, uh, not the, no computed logs uh, and no computations are involved. So uh, I just want to show you this layout briefly. It comes from the Geolog software of, uh, of Amazon. <clears throat> before Parlime. Um, and in the first track, uh, we have simply a gamma ray log and we just uh, color coded uh, according to the values. So low values get this like sandy color and high values get this shale, shale color. Uh, the next track is uh, again the gamma ray. And we know that quite typically the, the gamma ray increases in source rock compared to nearby uh, shale layers and so we simply set a cutoff and shade uh, all intervals that has high gamma ray values. In the next track we do exactly the same with the resistivity. Typically the source rock have elevated resistivity compared to, to uh, normal shales. <clears throat> Uh, but of course, if you have uh, hydrocarbons in the reservoir, you will get like false signals in the reservoir. So you have to be aware of that. Uh, then in the next track, we uh, combine these two logs and plot the gamma ray and resistivity in, in opposite directions and shade in between. We plot in a certain scale and shade in between uh, with red color. Uh, and the next two next tracks are a combination of the DT and the RT log, resistivity and sonic log. And when you plot them in a certain uh, scale, uh, you can shade in between them. And this will be in this way, 
interesting so uh, rentals with respect to source rock will 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 uh, be highlighted with red color and the difference between these two are just the scale so uh, on the right one this one uh, it shows more the highlight the best part of the source rock uh, and the final uh, track from for uh, for log evaluation is this uh, track uh, plot where we plot the DTS and the DT, the, the shear, shear and P wave uh, slowness, <clears throat> again in a certain scale and shade in between uh, with red colors. Uh, and and, and there, on the last one, there are some black areas and that is to, to get away, get rid of these uh, false readings in the reservoir. So that is usually a cut off on the gamma ray, uh, where gamma ray is below a certain value, we we uh, color with black color, so this is not uh, showing up. So the way to use this is just uh, uh, simply scanning through many wells and, and see where you have red colors. And we have done TOC calculations with more uh, <laughs> better methods like the, like the PASI and Schmucker equation and so on, calibrating to rock samples. And, but it's quite surprising how, how well this roughly fits the more advanced methods. Uh, so this can be used in a large scale screening. And then when you have found an potentially interesting area, you can look at that in more detail, typically using this other TOC calculation methods. And also, in addition, look at the mud gas data. I plotted that uh, and in the last track here to, to, to get um, a transition to the next speaker, Martin, that will tell us much more about the, the mud gas uh, readings. And you can see you have in this uh, potential source rock interval here, you have elevated readings of TOC here. And but also down in the reservoir, of course, where you have, where you have hydrocarbons. So then I, I give the word to you, uh, Martin. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Trond. Just awaiting the control. I have that. That's good. Or at least I think I have. Could you just go to the next slide, uh, Raghu, for a second? Perfect. So before I show you some results or preliminary results from a few NCS wells, I want to give you a very, very brief introduction to the mud gas logging and its application to, to hydrocarbon evaluation. And I will start with the importance. It's a data set which for decades was more or less neglected. But when we look at it, we use a lot of techniques in order to talk about the hydrocarbons we uh, discover or encounter in the subsurface. But there is only one continuous log which is directly measured using these hydrocarbons, that is a mud gas. It talks about what is there and how it, uh, what is it composed of. And in addition to that, this is a data set which is available for every well which is drilled. It doesn't matter if it's a wildcat or a production well, mud gas data are there. And on this little map here, you see a snapshot of some of the wells we are currently looking at. And this, these are over 5,000 wells, and it does not even include the production wells. So when it comes to the mud gas data, it's a tremendous database which covers the entire locked well talking about the hydrocarbons. When it comes to the process, it's actually very, very simple. It, everything starts with a drill bit, and while using it, you crush a cylinder of rock and you release the hydrocarbons, which are contained in the pore system of this rock into the mud, and then the mud transports it to the surface. And at surface, you have dedicated equipment. You have a degasser, which removes the lighter hydrocarbons from the mud, and then you have your detectors, GCFID, GCMS, etc in order to measure the different compounds. But despite the simple technology or the simple process which is involved, there are of course challenges. And one of the key challenges is that this degassing is incomplete. Within the degassing chamber, we have an equilibrium system, which means we are not able to get all the hydrocarbons out of the mud. And we also see some uh, degree of compositional fractionation, 
which means that the gas we get out of the mud is in terms of wetness drier than what we actually have in the formation. And the degree of this, it depends on the mud type, the mud temperature and uh, a few other things. However, there is of course a solution to the problem and that is called advanced mud gas. And that is a system which runs under constant thermodynamic conditions and allows us to get a representative composition. So representative of what is really in the formation. That is, however, something which is for specific purposes and that's something we run on every well. When it comes to the applications, I could now talk for a couple of hours and I don't have the time, of course. So just a few uh, ideas. You can talk about the contacts. Where are they? What type of contact? Is the fluid altered by secondary processes? Seal efficiency, connectivity, compartmentalization. You can start talking about the source rocks themselves. Where are they? What is the maturity and what type of source rock it is? But then more importantly, especially for the next slide, is you can use these data in order to talk where are the hydrocarbons and up to a certain point, how much of them are there? Is it a target? Is there anything in terms of missed pay? And then, of course, you can use the gas composition in order to talk about the fluid type association, so kind of a semi-fluid typing. So on this slide, I will show you three wells and only three because of space limitations. We looked into much, much more and I will show you the C1 concentrations as an indication of the gas levels and the gas wetness as an indication of its composition. So we have these three wells labeled one, two, three. Please note that for the methane, there are different uh, concentration scales and the methane is plotted in the red line. And then we have the wetness in orange, which is plotted on the upper line here. The depth range for all the three wells is 1000 meters. Highlighted in yellow now are the drop the formation uh, levels where we have uh, basically source potential. When we look into the first well and we look into the methane concentrations, we are somewhere in the range of 50,000 ppm. If we go to the next well, it's a little bit lower, it's around 30,000. And then for the last where we drop down to 20,000. So we have quite a bit of variability in, uh, in these wells. But what we've also seen is that within the Draupner, we see very often interbedded sandstone, sometimes siltstones. They're not always very thick, but they are there and they contain in a lot of cases, very high gas levels. I just labeled one example here where we have 800,000 or over 800,000 ppm of methane. So this one is full of gas. And that all looks a little bit like a reduced or a smaller Bucken hybrid system where source and uh, sandstones are interbedded, which of course raises the question if there is some untapped potential. And that is something we have seen not only in these three wells, but also in the other wells we've looked at. When it comes to the gas composition, here we're using wetness, which is C2 to C5 divided by C1 to C5 times 100. So a high value means wet fluid, low value means dry fluid. We see that we are actually at a very high level. At the level, if you would incorporate the shift due to the incomplete degassing, which leads us to the point where we have to talk about the presence of liquid hydrocarbons. It's a little bit different for the first one, uh, first well here, where we especially in the second level here, see a much uh, or a strongly reduced wetness, which is more towards uh, a gas. But when we talk about the gas composition in these systems, we have to, of course, include always the vitrinite reflectance, but also the uh, expulsion, because the, the level of expulsion does not only govern how much gas is left in the source, it also has an impact on the composition with a preferential loss during expulsion of the lighter hydrocarbons. So, and then the next step, I just want to compare these three wells with one well coming from a real unconventional system. And here we use an advanced mud gas system. So the gas composition you see is really representative. The well was drilled horizontally. You have the, the target horizon highlighted in yellow. And again, it's a 1000 meter reach interval in this case. So when we look into the gas levels here, we are around 200 to 250,000. So we see much, much more gas in this well compared to what we see on the NCS. And also the, the wetness, it's very, very high. And this is uh, oil indicative. And from the production, we also know that we have oil in place. So 
when we now start talking about these difference between, let's say, maximum 50,000 here and 230,000 here, there are, of course, a lot of factors which have to be uh, brought into the equation. And that is the level of TUC and also the extent of a high TUC level versus steps or reach. It's again the bitch right reflectance and the expulsion. And the expulsion will be one of the key drivers in order to see if a system could work or not. So, and that's the end of what I have to present. Uh, back to you, Radu. Thanks. Um. Yeah, so the, the question uh, or this analysis kind of shows it's preliminary uh, and the questions I had as a reservoir engineer is, okay, there is a source rock which kind of generates some hydrocarbons and expels it. But is there something remaining? If it is remaining, is it able to come out if I try to pull it out? And uh, at least now the indications are, yeah, th there is something there. It's lower than uh, some of the other uh, places in the world where we have produced it. But there are many more steps to be taken uh, to quantify how much is there remaining and uh, how much it can come out. The question then is, is it economical? And there always we kind of take today's uh, conditions. Same like uh, you look at the chalk, big giant, uh, uh, chalk reservoirs you are developed and then you decide on the other chalk uh, things. Uh, you do, you look at the costs which are on NCS today and you think, oh, it's impossible. But I'm going to try to show you. This is now a slide which shows the number of days taken in Gulf of Thailand. They have uh, oil and gas production there and it's uh, uh, Water depth is 60 to 90 meters, uh, mostly jacket uh, and jackets being used for field developments. They too used to take many days to produce the wells, uh, to make a well drilling and completion. And now they are making like 4,000 meter wells in less than eight days. And that has big implications on the cost structure, the efficiency and cost structure is quite related. A typical NCS well cost, the amount of metal or consumables or all these things that you actually have a cost price are just 10 to 15 percent. The rest of it is service company or is what is you are renting an equipment from the service company to do your job. Or these rig cost is a time based because you are using the rig for certain days, you're going to pay it based on time. These are time based. So if you imagine now on NCS, we drill maybe six wells a year. So if you have a big equipment which you have bought and you are going to rent it out just six times, you have to rent it out for a very high price to get back your same 10% return on your investment. In Gulf of Thailand, they make 45 wells. So the same company, they are baker huge in NCS, they are baker huge in uh, Gulf of Thailand, the same equipment you get paid 45 times. Of course, they can rent it out for lower cost. So they are the same companies. They are making same money. They are making same 8% return. But the cost of wells in the Gulf of Thailand is 2 million US dollars for a 4,000 meter well. And that is explained by this efficiency. So together, if you can uh, make a lot more uh, wells per year, the costs come down. So there is no reason to think that uh, offshore costs will always remain at the uh, level they are. And to support that, I'm going to show uh, the Gulf. This this is a plot which is days on the flat axis and uh, uh, measure depth on the vertical axis. This is uh, Johan Swaldrup. And I thought we were doing really good in 2018. But uh, when I came to uh, uh, Bakken, they were drilling 6,000 meter wells in 12 days. And I was kind of surprised. And that's where I started following this efficiencies. How are people doing in the world? And I found there could be ways where you can do it faster. It's not necessary to do it the way uh, we do it. When we are forced to, if you find a big giant uh, offshore continuous play uh, in on NCS, I think we'll be able to do much faster wells if needed. And this again uh, shows the example now of Gulf of Thailand on the same measured uh, days versus measured depth. 
they deliver 4,000 in six days. And that is by not using a lot of time to go in and out of a hole. You, you drill as fast. The slope of these plots, they are the same. That is, to drill a well, to make the drill bit making new hole, it uses same time in US onshore or NCS or Gulf of Thailand. But we waste a lot of time going in and out in this flat area. That is where after you have made the hole, before you put the casings and cement and everything in place, they do it really, really quickly in Gulf of Thailand. And there are different techniques to do that, but that is the key to getting cost down. And that is uh, once you start doing it on scale as well, they have smaller targets, they are needed. They can't have any other way than to drill the well in eight days to keep the cost at $2 million or they don't have a business. Same in Bakken. Bakken will not be economical if they start taking 60 day wells. And then offshore hydraulic fracturing. We talked about it. Uh, here is an example of Johann Sverdrup field and our Equinur operated field is almost the same size. 12 times 10 kilometers, uh, Johann Sverdrup is roughly the same. But the way it is developed is there are parallel wells, 10,000 to 15,000 feet in length, every thousand feet from each other. And if look at the topography, there are 250 fracturing vessels that have to come up. You have to make special roads to come up and go down so that they don't intersect or uh, give problems to each other. It's much, much easier to fracture it uh, offshore compared to doing it in this terrain. So there are some advantages. The fracturing can be uh, done when you do it on scale, much easier offshore than uh, even US onshore. So to summarize, I think what I'm going to say is that the Doubtner formation source rock in the study area at least contains hydrocarbons, uh, science to it. Gas levels are highly variable. They are low compared to the benchmark uh, unconventional. So it's early to comment on in place or producibility. Uh, most likely, at least the ones we have studied, it's more in the liquid areas or in the liquid part. Uh, we were targeting or hoping for more gas. Uh, and then finally, what I've shown is to take motivation from US onshore and also the cost structure. Keep it in mind, involve the reservoir and production engineers early to see uh, how it can be done and not base it on current costs. Uh, models. So scale is important. Uh, technology for factory mode drilling hydraulic fracturing uh, has some advantages offshore when done on scale. So be open to possibilities for production from both uh, tight as well as source rock or interbedded or many different things. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Raghu, uh, Martin, and Ron. A very interesting uh, talk uh, here and interesting work you are uh, you are doing. Uh, <clears throat> we have some. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions before we go for lunch. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, like, I guess this uh, you, you get to also identify uh, layers uh, in the overburden with this mudcast uh, technolo technology that you can. Uh, also apply uh, maybe also low perm layers carbonates for instance as you mentioned so have you have you seen uh, much of that or have you yeah, we're using the, uh, we're using sorry? our data set systematically to go through the different areas on the ncs to look for yeah what they call missed pay is there something sitting somewhere which we've overlooked in the earlier days and of course there is always something and it's a mud gas which gives you a very clear indication uh, very early that there is something and also gives you a good indication of what is there. And from there, you can start integrating all the other disciplines and data in order to figure out what's really going on. Yeah. Uh, now one question here. Uh, is the study finished? Are you planning for the maturation steps towards developing source rock resources? Uh, or at least the first part, we had a very short uh, sprint on this uh, is done and uh, we'll see what we do further. Uh, are you planning for offshore feasibility in the near-ish future? 
Ja, uh, yeah, didn't is it maybe perhaps asking about the the drilling part or the uh, yeah the uh, of the drilling part we are trying to see if we can do something uh, some of the techniques that we have learned from uh, Chevron if we can do it to reduce the time per well that we are looking at. Mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, uh, next question here. Any real time longer term HSE issues with very short time between well sections in Thailand versus uh, NCS wells? Yeah, the, the thing is, we, we had a very nice presentation where we invited the Chevron engineers to present. Uh, to us because now with the teams it's very easy you don't have to fly there you just uh, have them present it uh, what they and they were very open uh, through the technology sharing agreement we have with them how they do it and Chevron had the same principles of two uh, barriers so they follow all the same requirements that we have on NCSO globally even in Thailand when they do this fast operations so uh, it's I don't see that to be an issue it is if you want to do it you can do it and um, if I think very high level if today we certainly the explorationists come and say yes we have 5,000 square kilometers of nice source rock with uh, properties same like we see in onshore Argentina the engineers will find a solution uh, yeah uh, and then the, the last question here, uh, have you identified how we all can save most of uh, the well cost? Yeah, it is the efficiency. I mean, the same like Tesla, uh, it is Model X's or Model S's were sold with same 90 kilowatt hour batteries or 75 kilowatt hours batteries. And then the Model 3's came with the same 75 kilowatt hours battery, but they cost less because they are produced much faster on a bigger scale. So same if you want to now make your wells cheaper, you need to make it faster. The same number of people planning it, the same number of people working offshore, the same rig, you need to deliver more wells per year than you did today and the cost will come down per well. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Raghu, Martin and uh, Trond uh, for presenting for us. And uh, I think we'll, uh, the clock is now 12, so it's time to take a, take a lunch break. Uh, thank you to all the presenters in this uh, first session. And as uh, Matthias said uh, in the introduction, you'll all uh, get a, uh, a gift as a thank you for uh, for presenting. Uh, <clears throat> we now have one hour lunch, so we'll uh, start with the next session at uh, one o'clock. So uh, please be back uh, on time. <laughs>